and myself. Welcome to the National Family Support Technical Assistance Center's Office Hours running series. Today's topic is Trauma Skilled Practices for Family Run Organizations. I'm Gail Cormier, the Project Director of NASCAP, the Family Center of Excellence, and we're led by the National Federation of Families. This monthly Office Hours series is designed with the family workforce in mind. This series is targeted for family-run executive directors and emerging and current family leaders. We wish to support everyone in the family support workforce. In order to accomplish this, we will be hosting additional sets of series for other family support workforce staff as we continue along. But before we start our interactive conversation today, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's conversation is being recorded. The recording and any additional resources will be uploaded to our NASCAP website under the events tab. If you have any technical difficulties, please type your comment and someone will be able to assist you. Please also type your question for the presenters in the chat box. We'll be watching the chat during the entire presentation. And I really want to tell you, please, let's have this be a two-way conversation. So get ready and don't be afraid to ask any question you want. You could either private, private chat me if you don't want to, you want to remain anonymous. Or if you want to raise your hand and take yourself off mute, we encourage that too. So let's have a lively conversation today. Um, next slide. NASCAP uses family-driven language. That means we're inclusive. We use trauma-responsive, strengths-based. We avoid blaming caregivers. We're inclusive, person-first, respectful always, non-judgmental, and consistent with our actions. Next slide. And now I have a special treat for you. We at the National Federation of Families have put together a little video that we welcome you to share on all your social media sites in order to celebrate Children's Mental Health Acceptance Week. Dana. and get you excited for next month for Mental Health Acceptance Week and for the whole month. Um, and now I'll turn this over to Dana. Thanks so much, Gail. Thank you everyone for being here for our Office Hour series. 
Our series has run from October and will be wrapping up in June. So there are a few more sessions. The series is titled Supporting Organizational Well-Being and Leader Success Through Mentorship. And you can see recordings of all of the previous office hours on our YouTube page or the NAFSTAC events page. The goals for this series are to support executive directors and emerging leaders in family-run organizations through peer support during this time together, sharing your successes and challenges. We also bring in our subject matter experts like Dr. Addis to increase knowledge of leadership management and mentorship skills. And through our workbook, we provide a roadmap towards organizational well-being. So during our time together today, we're going to spend about 20, 25 minutes hearing from Dr. Addis about our skill today, trauma-skilled practices for family-run organizations. Um, we also will be providing you some tips for mentorships, uh, which we can facilitate. If you don't already have a mentor, make sure to go to the NAFSTAC website and do a technical assistance request. We provide some tips in our workbook for you. Um, today, we hope to have time for a peer discussion about what's working and all the challenges that you are having related to trauma-skilled practices, but that's also a time between office hours to talk with your mentor or mentee about that topic. And then our action plan gives you steps that are small and achievable each month to help you get to that place of organizational well-being by the time we wrap up in a couple of months. So we'd love to start today with a poll. We're going to be doing this on Mentimeter. So you can go to www.menti.com and a code will pop up. It'll, a little box will ask for the code 47415640. Four zero, and we'll be putting that in the chat as well. And we do have a question for you. We're wondering what percentage of the families served by your organizations are trauma impacted? So go ahead and head to menti.com, which we're going to put in the chat there, and enter the code 47415640. And we'll see. Are you all seeing my, Let me try that again. Are you all seeing my um, Mentimeter screen? Um, it is not coming up. All right, let me find that. There we go. All right, so it looks like we've got a few people answering between 25 and 50% or 51 and 75% of the families your organization serves are trauma impacted, but the vast majority of us are working with 76 to 100% of families that are trauma impacted. So hopefully this topic today is really, really um, useful for the work that you're doing. You can keep weighing in and we'll share the full results of that with you in the slide deck that we will be sharing um, with a follow-up email. So now I'd love to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Sandy Addis. He is the chairman of the National Dropout Prevention Center, which he joined in May of 2013. He has an EDD in educational leadership from South Carolina State University and 44 years of experience in public education. His roles include teacher, counselor, coach, principal, system level, and director of a regional education service agency. He's designed a variety of dropout prevention initiatives, including after-school programs, counseling, and service learning. Dr. Addis has also served as an alternative school principal and authored numerous grant proposals, funding summer programs, professional learning, family engagement, and character education. And that is just a brief bio of his. He has more that you can see on the National Dropout Prevention Center's website. And I would love to pass it over to Dr. Addis now. Thank you, Dana. Uh uh, greatly appreciate it, and I certainly uh, appreciate the opportunity to to spend time with you guys and to to be to be part of office hours today. It's, it's exciting for me. 
I'm coming to you from the upstate of South Carolina. Uh, National Dropout Prevention Center has people scattered all over the country, and we work all over the country. So, uh, just uh, so you'll know, we're we're actually the the nation's oldest and currently the most utilized resource for school people uh, to try to improve graduation rates. But a lot of what we do actually translates to uh, your work and to, to the work of agencies and, and, and family service and, and families. So uh, I'm really pleased to, to make that connection today. I was fortunate beginning about four and a half years ago to lead a team of researchers to, to look at the issue of, of childhood trauma and its relationship to, to the eventual school success of kids, which translates pretty much into to, to kids knowing how to behave and being able to learn well, and thus to graduate. And so we started that effort with a small group of, of actually three of us were researchers looking at this. And we found out that we had bit off a heck of a, a task. And so we, we added to our team, and over a couple of years, we wound up with a team of, of actually 30 researchers and practitioners and experts in the field of trauma and child success. And so from that, we learned a lot, and, and we, we went from that to developing uh, the trauma skill model. Uh, which I'm going to give you a, a short uh, overview of today and hopefully give you a couple of tips on how you can use it. And you can certainly go into this and, and dig into it on our website and other resources as you'd like. Let's go to our first slide for a minute. Here, here's a, a, a statement from, from one of our recent publications that more than half of our children are negatively impacted by childhood stress and trauma. And many, if not most, will never be identified. Now, uh, you said, and you all were quite accurate in your assessment of your, your survey that when you responded, and most of you said that 70 to 100% of the, the families and the kids that you serve are trauma impacted. That's probably very true. Uh, before the pandemic, we in the public schools would say that typically 50 to 60% of our kids were, were trauma impacted in some fashion. The pandemic actually compounded that issue because the pandemic added stress and trauma to the lives of many children. And the more distressed uh, situations those children lived in, the greater the impact, the negative impact of, of, of the pandemic on those kids. And certainly school closures and, and partial attendance and all those uncertainties that those kids and families faced uh, added to this issue. So, so I think you're pretty accurate to say that, you know, we can pretty well assume that, that most of our kids and our families that we work with uh, are, are, are trauma impacted. Now, when we talk about trauma, and if we go to the next slide, please, when, when we talk about trauma, it we typically think, well, it, it's an incident. Uh, there was a, uh, the kid was in a car wreck, there was a house fire, uh, there was a, a, a death in the family, uh, or there was, was abuse and neglect of the child, perhaps, by somebody. So we often think, well, trauma is a single incident. It, it is, it can be, but it can be much more than that. Go ahead and let's click through the, the slides here. The, the trauma can, can be a chronic adverse condition over time. Uh, a child can live in a, in a situation of poverty and uh, not know uh, when they're going to be evicted, for example. Uh, and, and, and those things just continue. Uh, a, a child can, can observe uh, an incident or situation, and, and it can be just as bad. When a child experiences trauma, when child A is, is traumatized, child B and child C in the family typically observe it and know about it. And sometimes the impact on the observing child can be just as negative as the impact on the experiencing child. So it doesn't have to be firsthand. Also, if you'll click to the next uh, bullet there, um, trauma can be visual or reported. Uh, think about kids watching coverage on television of a school shooting or, or a, a violent incident, and they, they, they watch it and they experience it to some degree. So it can be that, or if we go to the next bullet, uh, it can be predicted or anticipated. It actually never happened. Uh, this is probably necessary 
But think about what happens when, when we have in a school, elementary school, we have an active shooter drill. And we say to the children, now children, if we give you this code word, here's what you do, because we could have a bad person in the building with a gun. Think about how that affects children's uh, anticipation of trauma that probably is never going to happen. But here's the thing. If we'll go to the next uh, click, please. The perception and the psychological impact of trauma is more important than the incident or the source of the trauma. We found in our research that many uh, practitioners, many professionals spend a lot of time trying to find out, well, well, what did the kid experience and what was it? Who experienced the trauma and what happened to them? I hate to say it this way, but that doesn't matter that much in our business. What matters is the child has experienced trauma and uh, trauma type one and trauma type 12 typically have the same impact psychologically on children and the same outcome. And so it's not so important what happened as much as the fact that something happened and now we have to deal with it. So uh, that's sort of a, a concept foundation that we, that we need. Let's go to the next slide. When we were doing our research, of course, we were looking at this from a school perspective to start with, but when we were doing our research, we came to conceptualize trauma like this, this illustration. Trauma and stress for kids is like a brick wall. It's a brick wall between where they find themselves and where we would like for them to be. We know, and I'm not going to go into the brain research, we did a lot of that in our work, but we've got some, some content on that on our website, but when, when children experience trauma, it, it changes the way they think, the way they perceive, the way they react, the way they interact with people, and it, it's a barrier to, to their being able to function and, and behave and learn, whether they're learning in school or learning from some adult in the family, it's a barrier to, uh, to what they, they are experiencing what they what they are um what we'd like for them to experience and dana my, my screen just went went out are you, am i still with you you are sandy we can okay. still see you I, and hear you and i think we can see the slides still okay I can, can still uh, see oh, there the we slide. go okay we got it we're back okay Technology is wonderful when it, when I when an operator knows how to work it. Being me, but but think of trauma and stress for children as a brick wall between where they find themselves and where we would like for them to be. Uh, we would like for them to be happy. We would like for them to be to know how to behave and interact positively. We'd like for them to learn and function and succeed. So so that's sort of the way way we we look at at this whole issue of trauma. And we'll come back to this brick wall in a little bit. Another thing that we did when we were doing this research was we looked at what schools and what agencies around the country that work with children are doing about trauma. Now, we've been concerned as a, as a, a group of professionals about trauma for some years now. We've been thinking about it, and we, we found that, that there are a lot of things going on. A lot, of, a lot of agencies, a lot of school districts are doing a lot of things to try to help their professionals deal with the trauma. Many states have actually enacted legislation that requires that professionals in certain areas and certain categories, uh, whether it be schools or agencies, have a certain amount of training in this issue of trauma. But here's what we found. Let's go to the next slide. We found when, when we looked around the country and we actually found out and, and looked at what people were doing, and we found that there are two typical responses by professional organizations to this issue of trauma. The first one being, well, we need to train our staff. We need to train people about trauma. So we do trauma training. And we found a lot of that going on around the country. The problem we found with it was that it typically is, is not so much about what to do for the child, it's about what the trauma is, what happens to kids, and in many cases, how does it affect their thinking? Well, that's important to know, but that doesn't get us to what to do. And the other thing we found is a typical response of agencies and schools is to hire a specialist. Well, we need to put uh, a mental health therapist in this environment where these kids and families are because uh, they have these problems. Uh, that's good. Neither one of these approaches that we found going on around the country is bad. The problem is 
we don't think it's going to make a lot of difference. And we didn't find it making a lot of difference in most cases. Here's why. Training in trauma, knowing about trauma, does not tell us what to do about it. We can learn about it and be trauma-informed. And then hiring specialists, that's good, too. We, I wish we had a mental health professional in every school and every agency in the country. Here's the problem. If you've got an environment like an elementary school with 500 kids, and if half of them are trauma impacted and you, you put a, a mental health professional in that building, which is not a cheap thing to do, they can serve about 30 kids as a therapist and they'll never get around to everybody. So what we found was that just trauma training and hiring a specialist while good is not going to solve this problem. So, so then we begin to look, look deeper into this issue. And let's go to the next slide. And here's what we came up with. Here, here was our, our, our bottom line question. When we looked at, at trauma around the country, all the research, we did some of our own research. We looked at schools. We looked at agencies. We looked at what they were doing and the different models. And here's what we came up with. We know that some trauma-impacted youth recover and are successful, and some are not. So then the question becomes, why? Why are some trauma-impacted kids successful and some not? Now, I would venture to say that out of the, the, the population that we've got right here in this, this session today, uh, all of us being professionals in some form or another in, in, in human service and family services, I would venture to say that probably half of us were trauma-impacted in our early life. I was. But yet, look at us. We made it. We succeeded. And then so you have to ask yourself, well, how, how did we do that? What, what helped us to succeed when a lot of trauma-impacted kids don't? We found in our research that almost every kid that never finishes high school, that drops out, and that's about 17% of the national population that starts ninth grade, never, never finish school right now. We found that almost every dropout was trauma-impacted but we found a lot of graduates who were. So the question, why? And that's really where we, we went with our, with our research, trying to answer that, that why question. So looking back at what districts and, and schools and agencies are doing, let's go to the next slide. When you, when you look at, at, at what people were doing, we found basically that people were talking about being trauma-informed or they were talking about being trauma-sensitive. Trauma skilled, we did not find. Now we find it now, as I'll share with you in a minute. But what we found was when agencies and, and entities like the ones that you lead and manage and like the schools that I've worked with, we found that many of them will say, well, we're trauma informed. We have, we have learned about trauma. We've trained our staffs. Good, that's important but it doesn't tell you what to do about it. We also found that a lot of use of the term trauma sensitive. Uh, trauma sensitive typically means that uh, an entity, an agency, a group of professionals, they, they are not only trauma informed, but they are empathetic. They, they have concern. They want to do something for the people that are trauma impacted. But the, but the focus of being trauma sensitive tends to be on the sensitivity. I'll give you an example. In our, our trying to figure out what schools and districts were doing around the country, I went to a training that a district was doing. Uh, and they, they spent a day with all their staff members talking about uh, them becoming trauma, a trauma sensitive school system. And I sat through the training and, and it was good training, nothing wrong with it. And I walked out with a, a, a few participants, and they were mostly teachers. I, uh, so I asked one of the ladies walking beside me who I didn't know. I said, uh, you're a teacher. She said, yes. I said, what'd you think of that training today? And she said, oh, it, this trauma is terrible. I, I feel so bad. I mean, these kids, they, they go through so much. And 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 now I see... Now I see how, how bad uh, it, it can be. And I said to that person, I said, well, you know, you're a teacher. What are you going to do different in your class next week or next month uh, relative to this? And she said, well, I don't know. And I came to the conclusion trauma sensitive does not necessarily translate into trauma action. 
Uh, so uh, it's kind of like uh, in, in the, the, the video we saw early on, uh, you know, awareness is not enough. Uh, that phrase was there. And that's true for a lot of things. It's certainly true for this. So from that, we set about to develop something called the trauma skill model. How do we help professionals help the kids get over and around the brick wall and be successful? What happens? And how do we learn from what some people have done? So let's go to our next slide. We found, and I've talked about schools a lot, but we found that uh, that this, uh, and I'm losing my video again. Yeah, there we go. We found that, that this information of being trauma skilled is applicable not just to schools, but it's applicable to agencies and to family service entities. Uh, we did a lot of work with, for example, I just show you this slide just as an example, not that you can read the fine print, but uh, we worked with Bethesda Ministries down in Tampa, Florida to make their staff members trauma skilled. And they, from that, developed family guides. They developed uh, parent uh, information pieces. They developed uh, flashcards and brochures and videos to help family members become also trauma skilled. So let me give you a very short overview of what we're talking about. What did we find makes the difference? So let's go to the next slide. We developed a, a, a pretty complicated model. Uh, it's, it's a five-step model. It typically takes an agency about two years to implement if you do it with fidelity. And right now we've got uh, uh, right at 200 school districts in the country that have adopted the trauma skill model and they, they're becoming trauma skill schools. And we've got some agencies also like Bethesda Ministries that I mentioned. And this is a five-step model, and I'm not going to go into all the steps today. You can find all this information on our website. We've got a section uh, at the National Dropout Prevention Center site, which is titled Trauma Skilled. And you can pull up uh, a number of publications and read and learn and watch videos and learn more about it. But here's the key of it. The central piece of being trauma skilled is building resilience. What we found, the answer to that why question, why do some trauma-impacted kids make it and some not? The key is resilience. The children that are, are trauma-impacted and succeed have developed resilience. Now, let's go back to the next slide, please. And let's see what resilience is. Resilience is the process of successfully adapting to difficult or challenging life experiences through mental, emotional, and behavioral flexibility and adaptation. That's what we, those of us that have, were trauma impacted and yet made it around that brick wall, that's what we have. We, we've got that capacity. So how do we put that capacity to be resilient into children? Well, it's not simple, I'll have to, to tell you. But we, we looked at this in depth, and if we go to the next slide, what we found when we looked at the research of, of other people and our own research, we had 12 university researchers on our, our larger team, and we found that you can slice resilience into five pieces. And here they are. A child that, that is resilient typically has mastered connections, and we'll just go through the whole five of them, belonging and security, achievement, autonomy, and fulfillment. Now, we also found that trauma-impacted kids, unless someone has helped them put it back, do not have these characteristics. Trauma-impacted children tend to, to, to have been denied these five characteristics. Things have happened to them, experiences, circumstances have occurred, and they have not been able to develop and accomplish and internalize these five resiliency characteristics. So what we found is the key to helping trauma-impacted kids go over that brick wall and change the way they perceive and think to go to the other side of the wall is you put resilience back into their lives. They have to, re to, to recover the resilience that the trauma has taken away from them. Now, let me give you an example, and we've got a great deal of literature on our website about this, and it's a lot of training, but let me just give you an example. Let's take connection, for example. Connection 
is this concept that I have enjoyable and beneficial connections with responsible adults, and I can easily form other positive relationships. I can form positive relationships with others. Let's think about a trauma-impacted kid for a minute. Uh, you can imagine whatever trauma you'd like. Let's say we've got a, a, a maybe a, a family member that's that's problematic. Let's say we've got a circumstance. We've got poverty. We live in a, a, a difficult, challenging community or threatening situation. But if I live and grow up in, in that situation of trauma, connections are problematic for me. Could be for several reasons. It could be that some of the connections I've had or I've attempted to have were bad connections for me. Some th bad things have happened to me. And I, I tried to be connected and it didn't work out. Or I didn't have the opportunity to form connections. Maybe uh, I was, was reared by uh, an already overburdened uh, other family member outside of my parenthood, and, and they didn't have the time or the, or the capacity to make the connection with me. Or maybe I didn't have the, the, the neighborhood or the family members around me or the other peers around me. And so I don't know how good connections, number one, and I don't know how to make them, number two. So here I am, a trauma-impacted child without connections. Now, now, we know that for us to, to succeed, whether it's as a young person or a, an adult professional like us, you've got to be able to make connections. You've got to have them. You've got to use them. You've got to form them. And you've got to take advantage of them to succeed and accomplish what you want to accomplish. But trauma-impacted kids don't have that. So, so what we've learned is that this is just one of the five resiliency factors, but we have to train our staff members. We have to teach them to form good connections. We have to make sure that every child has good connections with responsible adults. And what we often find in, in a setting, whether it be a, an elementary classroom or a boys and girls club somewhere with a group of kids, we find that a lot of the kids do have connections. But we also, if you look real closely, you'll find that some of the kids are withdrawn and don't have the connections. They haven't experienced them. So we have to give them experiences with good connections. Now, sometimes kids that have been trauma impacted will shun connections. They're afraid of them because connections haven't worked for them in some fashion or another. So again, we have to go beyond that. We have to push a little bit and we have to make sure that those kids that, that are re reluctant to connect can learn to connect and can enjoy connections and can realize, oh, connections can work for me. I've had some, I've learned from these good adults, and I can make more connections, one of the resiliency factors. So I just give you that as an example of one, even though there are five, five various re resiliency uh, characteristics that we, we teach professionals how to develop. Sandy, if I could just jump in for a second, can you give us some examples of what connections are? Oh, sure. Types of connections? Sure, I can. I can. Uh, connections could could be with, with anybody, but but what we've learned is that that in our research is that successful kids have positive connections with responsible adults, and 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 those adults are adults who make that connection an advantage to the child. It's not just a connection because I'm an adult who enjoys you know, doing something for kids, I want to see them succeed. Um, we, we find, for, for example, and I, I'll give you uh, just, a, I'll give you a school example. Uh, we've done this in many schools. You can, you can take a, uh, take, take the fifth grade of a given school, and it may be 200 kids, and you can put the fifth grade teachers in a room, and you can put the names of every, all 200 kids on the wall, and you give the teachers little sticky dots, and you say, go around the room, and put a dot on the name of every child that you have a positive connection with. Now you can define connection however you like, but you know I know something about the child. I speak to them on a friendly basis. They they I I, I show them kindness. They they seem to like me. That kind of thing. So you have them go around the room, and it takes a little while. 
And then you look around at the names of the kids. And what you almost always find is about somewhere between half and 60, 70% of the kids will have a lot of dots. But you'll also find some kids that have no dots, meaning that they don't enjoy a connection with a responsible adult in that environment. Now you can do that in any kind of environment, but, but we often find that. So then the question becomes, how do we connect to those kids and give them beneficial connections? Let me give you another example, if you'll go to the next slide. Another, another one of the uh, resiliency characteristics is autonomy. Now autonomy means I'm allowed to make choices and I can determine my life's outcomes by my choices. That's a resiliency characteristic that, that helps uh, the kids get over and around the brick wall, so to speak. Now, one of the things we find is, is that we as, as adults, whether we're leading a, a group of kids out on a basketball court or whether we're uh, teaching a class or whether we're, we're giving instructions to our staff members as a professional leader, we often find ourselves not giving our, our, our people we work with, whether it's adults or kids, many choices. We often think, well, leadership is telling people what to do. And yet we, we know that a, a trauma-impacted kid has not had many choices. They've had their choices, in many cases, taken away from them. They don't get to choose things. They, they often live in uh, very directive environments or, or bad things just happen that they have no control over in, in, their, in their mind. And so they come to think, you know, I don't get to make many choices. Choices are, are done for me. Things are done to me. So I don't get to, to drive my ship. I don't get to, to, be, uh, to have a sense of, of choice in my life. And that's one of the resiliency characteristics that we teach. So how can we as adults, how can, can we improve autonomy even within our environment, whether it's we're, we're supervising other adults, whether we're, we're teaching parents, whether we're teaching kids? Well, we, we can give choices. Uh, a lot of times, and I catch myself doing this, I've been in, in leadership roles for a long time in the school business, and I often catch myself thinking, you know, I just need to tell them what to do. I just need to, to lay it out, prescribe the actions, and make sure people do it. Well, we often do that with kids. We do it with our staff members. But we have to give autonomy opportunities in order for kids to and adults too, to learn to make choices. If they believe that they don't have choices, and which many trauma-impacted kids and, and as they grow up to be adults do believe, I don't have choices. I don't get to make choices. Well, when I do get to make choices, then I get to see the results of my choice. So the more choices we can give, we can say to our staff, you know, if you're supervising a group of adults who are training parents and family members, you can say, here's what we do. Or you can say, here's what we want to accomplish. Let's let you choose how to do it and achieve the, the outcome that's desired. And then we can teach them to teach parents to give kids choices. Many parents who well-intended, but who, who have, have grown up themselves in traumatic situations, they tend to be directive. They tend to not give choice to children. And yet we learning to make choices is a resiliency characteristic that helped many of us get over that brick wall. So let me conclude with, with one last slide here. If I may, let's go back to that brick wall. We can't, as adults, working with trauma-impacted kids and families, we can't make the trauma go away. We can't erase it. It's happened or it's continuing to happen. And in many cases, it's outside of our, our control. What we can do is rebuild resiliency of the children and sometimes the adults on the, the wrong side of the wall so that the wall becomes smaller, the wall becomes more manageable and they can go over it and around it. So what we, we learned in our research and in the model that we developed, which I just, just skimmed over the top of, it's a lot of content, but, but if we teach our adults and our, our, our teachers and our, and our family uh, support personnel, 
if we teach them to be trauma skilled, meaning they know how to rebuild resilience at every opportunity, then the people they work with, the children and the family members can go over that wall and beyond it be, and be successful. They can be learners. They, they can be, uh, uh, you know, uh, appropriate behavior and interacting people, and they can be successful. And uh, in, in my business of school, they'll graduate. That's what we found. So uh, the trauma skill model is, is a, a, it's a little complex. There's a lot to it, but that's sort of it in a, in a thumbnail is how do you re rebuild the resiliency? And we can teach that. You can teach that if you learn about it. Uh, you learn the resiliency factors, and then you learn how uh, how we can do our jobs to, to improve them and, and, and instill them in kids and families, then we can rebuild resiliency. So that's just a summary of uh, the trauma skill model. Uh, I hope it's of value to you. Uh, our website is easy to find. It's www.dropoutprevention.org, or just Google dropout prevention. We're the first uh, non-advertised hit. And on that website, you'll find a, a, a trauma skill section with a boatload of videos and uh, publications that may help you. Andy, that was just a fabulous presentation. Thank you. Um, we have been getting chat questions all along while you have been speaking, and I have a feeling this is going to be a very vocal group. So Good. everyone, get ready. Take off your mics. I'm going to ask a couple of questions that came in, and then we'll be free for anyone to ask any questions. The first question was, this person is wondering about the DSM diagnosis and the division happening now be about trauma being overdiagnosed or overstressed. Do you see that, Sandy? Well, yes, but I don't know that it's it's over uh, stressed or overemphasized. We found in our our research again, we were looking at you know we started out with school kids, and 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 we concluded from from our research and everybody else's. However, you define trauma, whether you use uh, a DSM definition, and that's changed over the years to to, to focus on the psychological impact. We believe that that trauma is is widespread. And uh, we found that when, when we, we interviewed uh, kids, we had uh, we looked at kids that were, for example, in alternative schools, uh, every kid in alternative programs, which means they, they were having trouble with learning and behavior, were trauma impacted. We could we could trace it back to the trauma. So so I would not agree that it's overdiagnosed. As a matter of fact, the other thing that we we, we noted, we came to the conclusion it's not so important that you diagnose it. We don't have to find the, the kid that has the trauma. We, we will never find all the trauma impacted kids and be able to say, yes, this particular child had this particular trauma and this is the, the, the solution for that child. Because what we concluded was the solution is rebuilding resiliency whatever the trauma was. So, so we take a much broader approach than just uh, saying, we've got to find the child, we've got to diagnose, we've got to treat specifically. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm an executive director of Foster Connections and Belonging and Achievement in their organization that, that complements what you're talking about. I, I think I understood it. How can an executive director foster that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the, the first thing is, is again, is learning about the, the resiliency factors. And, and we did a lot of research on resiliency. There's been a lot of resiliency research out there for years, and there are several different resiliency models, everything from, from some very, uh, you know, academic models to we found that some of the Native American cultures have some very uh, good resiliency concepts and definitions that they use in their in, in their culture. And so when, when we looked at all the different resiliency models, we, we knew that we had to boil it down to something that a professional, an educator, you know, Ms. Beasley, the third grade teacher, or Mr. Jones, the, the family uh, service trainer, whoever that person would be, they had to be able to, to conceptualize resiliency. So we put it into five buckets. Those five buckets of connections, uh, autonomy, uh, achievement, 
uh, belonging uh, slash safety and and uh, uh, can't think of the last one. All of a sudden, I got the what was the last one? <laughs> I wrote it. Uh, uh, Fulfillment. Fulfillment. Yes. Okay. I'm thinking about three things at once here, and I'm and I'm 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 beyond my capacity and age. But at any rate, so so we we put it in those five buckets, and 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 we came to the conclusion that when it, it, when we found uh, uh, children, groups of children in in a school or an environment where those five resiliency factors are fostered and taught. Those kids were succeeding, even if they they came from very challenged and difficult environments and situations. And if you think about it, if, if I've got good connections with that, I'm a, think of me as a child. I'm a kid, fifth grader. I'm Johnny, and I've got good connections. I get to make choices. I feel like I can achieve, and I feel safe and secure, like I belong in this classroom or this place, and I have fulfillment, meaning I can do good for others and feel good about it. If I've got those five things, this is a pretty good life situation. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing well. I've got what I need to, 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 to behave, to learn, and to go forward. So in a positive fashion. So that's the way we, we, we sort of uh, conceptualize it and I'd answer that question and I, I digressed a great deal but to answer that question first thing is for a professional learn the five resiliency factors master them come to understand what they are and then secondly teach your people to to foster those things teach them the five resiliency factors and teach them to foster those things at every opportunity. One thing we we found in, in the, the schools that we were working with and, and, and some agencies also, but particularly the schools, we insist that, that the bus drivers, for example, learn about resiliency. Bus drivers can build resiliency uh, just as well as teachers can. And one of the things we also found in, in schools and in agencies and in organizations is that if everybody is not working together to rebuild the resiliency factors, one outlying staff member not knowing what the resiliency deal is, they can undo what the other staff members do. And so we found that it's very important for everybody to have this information. Hey, that's excellent. I'm going to invite everybody if we can take the spotlights off and just have everybody come together as a group and take off your mic, you know, put your mic on so you can speak and put on your cameras if you feel comfortable so we can all be a group. There are tons of questions here. Um, one from Patty says, the staff at our organizations frequently our, our trauma impacted. Remember, we're family run organizations and most frequently our staff have trauma. How do you manage a staff of adults with trauma experiences? And Sandy, if you can't answer that, I welcome others to answer that. And share. I'll, I'll give you a short response and then I'm sure there are other people that have some, some excellent ideas. Uh, trauma impacted staff, you know, particularly uh, in, in some, uh, and in my experience, I was a, a director of some alternative programs. And in those situations, you got a lot of, of trauma impacted staff members. Uh, we're working with troubled kids, troubled people. Uh, and we got, in some cases, some troubled staff members. And we, we have our traumas as well. We have our problems. We have our stressors. So, the, so one thing is, you know, we've got to help our staff members understand this whole issue. What is it? What's happening to me? Why do I sometimes think this way? Why do I assume something when I really should assume, assume A when I should assume B? So we've got to help them understand it. Then we have to understand if they lack the resiliency, if our staff members lack the resiliency. For example, if I have a staff member that believes I don't have any autonomy, I don't get to choose anything. Things are just done to me. So tell me what to do, you know, and I'll try, but I don't feel like I have a choice here. We have to, to rebuild their resiliency. And, and sometimes we find that, uh, particularly when, when, when your staff members themselves uh, or, or have experienced trauma, maybe as a child, maybe currently. So we got to rebuild it in them. They can't help unless they haven't have some help themselves. Thank you. Does anyone else? Would anyone else 
like to contribute to the solution? As a former executive director, Sandy, I found that what you just said was really correct, that if we give staff, particularly those who do not feel that they have that autonomy, autonomy or abilities to make choices, or even the ability to have a conversation with their boss, me, and say, I don't feel comfortable doing this, can I do X? Giving choices is a really big piece of keeping your staff and making staff feel like they're contributing positively. Mm -hmm. um, any Anything else on that? Renee, would you like to jump in? I know you're giving us the thumbs up. No, it sounds great. I, I, I'm just absorbing everything. And you know, well, what I love about this too is I often hear anecdotally, you know, people say, oh, I'm from the old school and we give kids too many choices and that's the problem with this. And it shows a lack of understanding because this is a different time our children are growing up in. It, trauma is everywhere. You know, they just go on their phone and they they feel traumatized. So this is very helpful. No, great to hear. I what are the other two ones? Um, autonomy, fulfillment and connection. What's the other two? Achieve, uh, uh, let's see, uh, connections, uh, achievement, belonging, and security, and fulfillment. Uh, Thank you. Fulfillment, if I can just take just a short uh, say, fulfillment's often the ignored one. That's the one that, that we often forget about because it's a little harder to, to deal with. Fulfillment means I can do good for others and I benefit from the doing good. I feel good about it. A lot of trauma-impacted kids never get that opportunity. Uh, they never get a chance to do good for others. And so, and yet many of us and, and many, all of you, I, I would be willing to bet, you know, here we are, look at our profession. We're, we're in a profession where we're trying to do good and, and probably being poor doing it, you know, uh, but we're, we're trying because we're here. This is what we want to do. And so we learned the, the value personally of doing good for others or trying to do good for others. A lot of people never get that one and they have to have that experience. They have to have some something sort of created, if you will. And as a leader in a family run organization too, I can see why our staff are drawn to this field. And some of it can definitely be fulfillment. You know, they're, they're getting their they're working out their trauma by helping others. Um, I have another question. Do these skills assist with adults as well? Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, you know, the, the, the question is uh, for, for, for a given adult, and I don't mean to, to put my therapist hat on here, but for a given adult, my question is, does that adult have resiliency characteristics? Do they have they learned them? Do they have they mastered them? Do they internalize them and do they use them? And if, if I'm talking to an adult and or I'm interacting, say it's a staff member, a member of my, my professional staff, and I sense that they lack one of those resiliency skills. For example, we have a, a staff meeting and they push back from the table. They don't say anything. They don't talk. They, they seem to be the social outlier of the staff, if you will. Then they, they probably lack the, the connection piece. They don't uh, in, enjoy connections. They don't make them well. They may fear them in some fashion. And so we need to help them feel connected you know it may take a little work but so a lot of times when when an adult particularly a staff member when when they are are i hate to say use the word deficient but when, when they they lack one of the resiliency skills they tend to shy away from, from it completely i don't you know it's kind of like before i learned to swim i didn't like to go to the pool because i couldn't swim you know and so we have to 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 edge them into this and ease them into these things somewhat that's excellent. Um, other questions? We have time enough for at least one more question. Hi, it's Renee again. I was wondering, how do we advocate or how do we find out if our local districts 
um, are partnering with, with your organization? How do we advocate for them to do so? That's, that's a very good question. We found that, and I'll put my, my superintendent hat on here for a minute, a lot of, of, of school people are, they're caught up in so much, you know, they've got so many things to be concerned about. And, and then they say, well, we're not therapists, we're, we're, we're teaching math and science and reading type thing. Here's the problem. If, if they don't deal with the trauma, the math, science and reading doesn't happen very well. But, but how do we find out? Uh, a lot of, of, of school people are, are concerned now about safety and, and the trauma skill model in the school business is actually a school safety preventive factor. Uh, in the, the, the literature about uh, childhood trauma, uh, and, and there, there's a term, and, and it's a terrible term, it's called the, 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 the traumatized school shooter. It's a child that had trauma, went to school, the trauma was unresolved, they couldn't get over the wall, they dysfunctioned, they blamed the school, and they came back and transgressed against the school. We see it all in the news all the time. And so if you want to get school people's attention, let them know that this type of, of work for their staff is a school safety preventive measure. It's not a locked door. It's a way to help kids not need to aggress against their school. Perfect. I, Thank you very much. I think we could go on and on forever here, Sandy. This has been, for me, really, really a great presentation. So thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Dana so she can talk about the action steps. But I do want to just say thank you. Go ahead, Dana. Thank you so much. Um, and I've had the pleasure to watch Dr. Addis's longer trainings before, and I do really recommend that you visit the links that will be shared with you in our workbook so that you can learn more about the full trauma skilled model, which is very applicable to family run organizations. So we're going to send you away um, with a link to that workbook in the follow-up email, and we're going to ask you between now and our May office hour if you can reflect on your organization's mission, programming, and practices, and just think about whether or not they are trauma-skilled, and then identify ways you can make some changes to those things um, to become more trauma-skilled. And then finally, we ask that you meet with your mentor and mentee to have a rich individual conversation about this topic. We hope that we'll see you next month on Tuesday, May the 9th at 3 p.m. We're going to be hearing from Stephen Jackson, who's the founder and CEO of Jackson Core, a documentary film company, and Joe Tyler, who is the professor emerita at the Graduate School at Penn State University, who is just an expert in storytelling. They're going to be talking to us on um, Children's Mental Health Awareness Month about how to move from awareness to acceptance through storytelling. So this is a great one to come to if your organization is really getting into our grassroots campaign for Children's Mental Health Awareness Week um, so that you can learn how to share this storytelling concept with the families that you work with. Um, we will give you some links to our websites and our contact information. If you have any questions at all, please do reach out. And finally, when you close this Zoom link, a survey will pop up on your screen to give us a little bit of feedback about today's session. You can also pull out your phone right now and scan the QR code, or there should be a link popping into the chat. Um, we really do appreciate your feedback, and it helps us show SAMHSA that folks love the topics that we have and want more of it. Um, so please do give us your honest feedback, and we hope to see you next month. Yeah, and have fun on Children's Mental Health Acceptance Week. Bye.